Well, hello, everybody. This is Tim Green with Rattle Magazine. Welcome to Rattlecast number 59. Thanks so much for joining us. We have a great episode for you today. Our special guest is Taylor Molly. The man and the legend is here. And we have his uh, metaphor dice and two of his most recent books um, that we'll be sharing with you today. Before we begin, though, I should say that Rattle is a publication of the Rattle Foundation, a 501c3 nonprofit working to promote the practice of poetry. We've been in continuous publication since 1995, that's 25 years, and we are unaffiliated with any other organization. We just do this because we love poetry, and if you like poetry as much as we do, please do click the like button and subscribe, no matter where you're listening to this, whether it's YouTube, Facebook, Twitter, Periscope, iTunes, SoundCloud, whatever, there's always something you can click. Click that right now, because that helps out a lot. Now, um, for the warm-up poem today, um, I clicked the random button, and one of my favorite poems we've ever published came up. So I'm going to have to read this, because there's no audio, but um, I'm getting over my fear of reading other people's poems live. Um, This is Lynn Mason Shapiro, another New York City poet, um, and this is Sloan Kettering. It won a Pushcart Prize in, um, what year was this? 2006. And um, it was the, one of the only poems she published while she was alive. And this was the first poem she ever published. In Rattle number 26, um, she died um, a, a, about a year later uh, of breast cancer. She was a dancer and then took up poetry at the very end of her life. And um, her husband made a book, um, New Love, which you can find just on Amazon. Google Lynn Shapiro, L-Y-N-N Shapiro, uh, New Love, and you can find that. But this is Sloan Kettering by Lynn Shapiro. Sloan Kettering. One thing they don't tell you about Sloan Kettering is how beautiful the workers are. Shepherdesses, sirens, brawny football players ready to lift the heaviest bodies. One, rosy as a mountain child, moves like the most even glare of light, never turns away till you have risen to follow her. She holds your paper file near her breasts, but not too tight. Walls are paved with photographs, scenes of mountains, forests carved by light. The chemotherapy suite is a skylight, a bubble. You pass posters for support groups presented on easels like paintings in progress. There are private rooms for each patient with chairs and blankets and a straight-backed chair for a companion if you have one, and a little television with its snake arm riveted into the wall. In the center of all these private rooms are gatherings of high-stocked flowers, magenta, purple, amber, bursting higher than churches, and golden vases everywhere. And the carpet is gold, too, so padded you can hear no sound of walking. There are so many workers here, and your surgeon, Alexandra, is the most beautiful worker of all. Her office where you wait is the color of cool green and mountain cream. A computer pulses out deep blue insignias. Next to it is a magazine, half the cover missing, torn or half eaten, waiting for you to touch it in the same place as the person before you. You don't in this decision. Its stillness, its inability to reverse is profound and stagnant. Outside, in the hallway, other doctors stand leaning, writing with a concentration of animals eating food, whose only purpose is to become blind to everything but their own sustenance. And she is the sun. She is beautiful when she enters, says, how are you? And you lean on her R. She opens your robe like the earth, and you say, I used to have beautiful breasts. And she says, you still do. And she cups your breasts. This is her special way. She cups each one, then combs down, down with her fingers, as if down the side of a mountain she is scaling tenderly so as not to fall once. She half closes your garment, and you close the rest. You watch your fingers leave your robe, how they arc in the air to papers on her desk. And you realize that at various times in the past five years, you have thought of her fingers, their short nails, and how she called you and said into the mouth of her phone, really as an afterthought, that in the sight of the malignancy, we found a little milk. A little, she said, like the purr of a cat. And you can see her fingers, her surgeon's fingers holding her own child, children's milk bottles. And then, as you will always, you will want to be like her, to save lives during the day, then go home, feed your children at night. You remember the way out on the soundless carpet. Your husband is with you, 
murmurs, your husband, the lobby, just as you remember, in subtle shades, tones of green and gold. And that was Lynn Mason Shapiro with her uh, 2006 Pushcart Prize winning poem, Sloan Kettering. Um, now, as I mentioned, today's guest is Taylor Molly. Um, and, and Taylor, we published him for years, and he was winner of the um, Rattle Chapbook Prize in 2017 for The Wedding Stone. He's also um, one of the most well-known poets to have emerged from the Poetry Slam movement, and one of the original poets to appear on the HBO series Deaf Poetry Jam, a four-time national Poetry Slam champion. He's the author of four collections of poetry in a book, The Wedding Stone, which, of course, won the Rattle Chapbook Prize. He's the author of the acclaimed nonfiction book, What Teachers Make, in praise of the greatest job in the world. Um, in April of 2012, Mo Molly donated 12 inches of his hair to the American Cancer Society after convincing 1,000 people to become teachers. He lives in Brooklyn, where he curates the Page Meets Stage reading series at the Bowery Poetry Club. And here he is, Taylor Molly. Hey, Taylor, how you doing? I'm so honored to be here. Well, I've been watching the Rattlecasts and s secretly uh, jealous <laughs> uh, of all the... I mean, you have so many of my favorite poets. I remember um, Danusha Lamaris is a sort of a new... I'm a new fan yeah, of Yeah, me too. I didn't know how good she was Spencer. until um, and she was oh, on. Like, no, we published so a couple of her poems that were great, and then I read her book, and I was just blown away and talking to her yeah. was cool, yeah. And I, I, I can't remember... Um, why i found some excuse uh to email you uh like in march oh, you know what April. it is actually what was it's it? that um we, you were supposed to be uh, featuring at our rightwood literary festival this weekend and um oh was it gonna it be was gonna this be this weekend, weekend. we right. had to cancel oh, because of the coronavirus so um I was looking so looking forward yeah, to that. Yeah. Uh, so so you reached out to me and I and I said, "Yeah, absolutely, let's postpone it." And um but I was secretly hoping <laughs> that you'd say, "Oh, and you know what? Come to think of it, we do this thing called the Rattlecast and we should have you." Yeah, well, that's exactly so. how it worked. <laughs> so Yeah. Yeah. So yeah. um do you want to start us out with a poem? Um, I don't know where you want to go to begin with, but but let's do something. Let's um I, I was really uh taken by that Shapiro poem. My, my mother died of breast cancer and, and uh, we grew up in New York and, and, um, and so Sloan Kettering was her, um, was her, her hospital. Um, I really enjoyed that poem. So, um, but let me, let me, let me read a poem um, from the, from the, the, chapbook that you yeah, published sure. uh the, the wedding stone the wetting stone i've had people who I, I go on on interviews and people say now your book published by rattle the wedding stone oh my goodness i just realized <laughs> saying out loud that it sounds like wedding um i think maybe the technical term is a whetstone a whetstone mm -hmm. and these are all poems for the for the uh, death of my of my first wife rebecca and let me read that poem about um, about sharpening knives. Um, Which page is that? I, I, I'm, I, I should have known. Well, uh, I should have figured it out before I um, mentioned to you. <laughs> I, I told myself I would never be that that poet <laughs> who's like, I'd like to read a poem. Oh, it's not. In is it the book. second pass? Is that the one you're talking about? Yeah, yeah, yeah that's, that's page where, 13. Yeah, Oh, there, yeah. page, the second pass. The first pass along the wedding stone creates an edge too fine to last. The second, more blunting pass tempers the edge into usefulness. Together, we used to hone blades so unutterably precise, tomatoes would slice themselves open to expose their reddest flesh. Later, in the restaurant's kitchen, when the head chef needed a knife screaming in French, he came to her station and used one of hers. She told me this with pride one night, and then put her hand on my chest and cried stainless steel tears I could not understand. When she jumped from the window, and they searched the apartment. They found in the bedroom a knife 
its edge unbloodied, as sharp as a razor. And I keep thinking of the second pass, how it sharpens and dulls the working edge, how the one has a real and necessary need of the other to do what it does. All my poems are based in truth, some based in a little more truth. I give myself permission to change the facts of a poem if it's going to make a more truthful poem. Po poetic license is uh, sort of a, a permission to lie in the service of creating a better a better poem. I've always believed, um, but this is this is um, based. I mean, this this was. I always tell my students that it's a terrible, every detail that you put in a poem has to have a reason for being there other than, uh, other than the fact that that's merely the way it happened. You know, you say, oh, why did you say that? Well, because it's true. Yeah, yeah, I know. I don't care that it's true. Why did you, why did you decide that it makes it into its poem? But that is, my, my Rebecca used to work at a restaurant and uh, one of the things that I would do for her was I sharpened her knives. I sharpened her knives every day, every day. And I sharpened our own knives, too. Um, and uh, consequently, she she came up to me and said, you know, when the head chef needs a needs to, a sharp knife, you know, the head in order to be a head chef, you have to be just angry all the time and whenever he needed a chef a sharp knife he went to her station she wasn't the sous chef i've been writing, watching a lot of ratatouille with my with my five-year-old so i can name she wasn't the uh, chef de partie <laughs> and she wasn't the demi chef de partie but she was just a um, a line a, one of the line cooks and uh, but he knew that her knives were the sharpest and i i just felt so utterly insufficient as a husband um, of, of someone uh, who suffered from, we, we now call it um, um, it's a it's a common bipolar term disorder? Uh, bipolar yeah. bipolar mm -hmm. yeah that's what but that that, we, that was sort of this is tw almost twenty years ago and we I think she I think she said hey my therapist says that there's a name for what I have and it's called being bipolar um, but she she um, yeah, I feel like she, she, she needed the other edge. You know, yeah, she yeah. she was maybe I was the blunting pass. You know, she by herself was too sharp. How how did anyway, it feel to to, um, to to publish this book? That's something I've always wondered. Like, was it a? Does it feel like it helped close a door? And 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 it's such a Absolutely. such an important you know personal thing to share with the world and so many readers. Um, how did it just feel putting putting that story out there? Well. There's there's one poem in this book called The Entire Act of Sorrow that took me 10 years to write because I just was terrified of uh, the line where I where I say, you know, I I knew that she I, I knew that she was going to do this even and I cannot bear to say I even hoped she would. Um, it's, you know, it, as teachers, we often can't take our own advice, but I tell often tell my students that the whatever it is that they are most afraid to put on paper is probably what the world most needs to hear. Um, so I, Rebecca died in, in 2004, um, in September, September 13th, 2004. Uh, in fact, this is the, this was the first year, six, 16 years later that a friend out of the blue texted me on the 13th mm -hmm. and said, I know this is probably a difficult day for oh, you. Wow. And it's like, oh my goodness, I forgot for the first time in 16 years, I forgot that this was the, uh, the anniversary of her, of her death. Um, I, I, she died in 2004. I had a book of poetry come out on Right Bloody in 2009. And then another book was, uh, came out in 2013. Um, and so there were other collections of poetry where I thought, um, Oh, I'll put a couple of the poems that I've written about Rebecca in in their own section, you know, and this book will be about love, but then there will be a darker section that's the suicide poems. And uh, like twice for two different books, I realized I, I can't do that. These those poems, they can't exist in in another book, in another collection. They were just they were they were. They made the the whole book be about that, mm -hmm. 
And so I've known for a long time that I would have to publish a, a book of, of just poems about, about Rebecca. Um, and that I had what, maybe 20, you know, so it was like chapbook size was going to be perfect. And so mm -hmm. when the rattle, um, when the rattle chapbook prize just seemed to be the right time. And I was like, Oh, you know what? It's, it, I'll, I'll, I'll put them in. And so I'm, th I'm so thankful that you chose, that you chose that. Well, I still remember when, when we did. And, 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 um, I think I read it, I read it first and then, uh, was weeping and then Megan read it and was weeping. Then Alan read it and was weeping. Then Asher read it and was weeping. And we're all just weeping separately. And, uh, and we knew that was going to be the winner as soon as we started, you know, if you have an emotional reaction to a book, which is pretty rare, um, that's usually something to, that's worth publishing. And if everybody does, then, um, it definitely but, is. But but to answer your question, um, it was it, it is absolutely part of my healing process to to like close the chapter, mm -hmm. you know, and um, and publish those poems. I still I still write about Rebecca, but um, but uh, not as much because I feel like okay, I've done that, I've done that, and uh, and that poem, the entire act of sorrow, um, you know, people people come up to that, you know, you you what you are most afraid to put on paper is what the world needs to hear. And people come up to me and say, um, I, you know, I thought that I was the only one who thought that my mother, um, battled depression and it, you know, I, I got so sick of it, you know? Okay. Um, so thank you. So, so, um, it makes me feel like a real Do you poem. want to read that poem since you mentioned it a couple of times? I guess I yeah, should. That'd be good. Twice, and then we can right? move on to the next book, I think. Okay. okay. All right. Sure. It's on page 22, by the way. Thank you. I almost know it by heart, and uh, maybe I'll look up a couple of times uh, and pretend to, to do this by heart. And uh, are you going to be showing people yeah, the text? Yeah, it'll be. Well, maybe they can follow, maybe they can see where I mess yeah, up. Uh, yeah, go ahead. Uh, um, the entire act of sorrow. Because men murder their wives every day, I'm not going to try to do it. Because when a woman dies and it looks like a tragic accident, a botched burglary, or even, in fact, especially a suicide, it too often turns out to have been, surprise, surprise, her husband. I wonder if, when the detective called me to tell me what had happened to Rebecca, it seems your wife has taken her own life. Those were the words he used, seems, and taken her own life not killed herself or committed suicide instead, and nothing more than seems, even though she was dead. I wonder if, as I began to cry the tears I never cried when first my mother and then my, when first my father and then even my mother died, I wonder if he was secretly tape recording my, taping my every word, my breathing, the entire act of sorrow for playback at some future date just to see if I sounded like an innocent man. We can go back and look at that stanza later, but I think it's all one sentence. Because later, after the services, after the shrine of flowers and candles disappeared as suddenly as it had bloomed on the sidewalk, after the medical examiner made her final ruling and I was allowed to break the tape that sealed our apartment, and walk in on her last night, the scene of the crime, untouched except for the window, from which she had jumped, now closed, but everything else, the small and final stones of her ritual still lying in a cross on the floor, goldfish floating dead in the fish tank, even as I bagged and gave away her clothes, invited friends to take what fit, if they could, to remember. I wonder if I still or ever was considered a suspect in her murder because I think sometimes I should have been. I don't mean that I was there or opened the window for her, gathered her screaming in my arms and let her go, but rather by the small sad cloud that hung over her and which rained stinging black bitter tears on her daughter of the Holocaust head, I knew that she would one day do this. 
even, and I cannot stand myself for saying so, even hoped that she would in the same outrageous secret way you might hope a dog like our dog the one she picked out herself because she cowered he cowered in the back of his cage as though he did not expect to be saved from the shelter in the very same way you might hope to god this dog will die before you have to put him down that was the entire act of sorrow from the wedding stone. Thanks for reading that, Taylor. Just such a moving poem. Hard to write. I mean, I took took a stab at that um, for years. Maybe not a decade, but 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 many years um, trying to trying to write that. Um, do you want to? First of all, I should say, if anybody has any questions for Taylor, um, I'm looking at both Facebook and YouTube's comment. Um, streams, so feel free to ask any questions there and I'll pass them along. Um, if you are watching on YouTube or, or Twitter or Periscope, I'm not, so don't leave questions there, but leave questions. I can only have so many screens open at once. But um, Facebook or YouTube, I'm uh, taking questions for Taylor. Uh, let's move on to your next book, Taylor, your newest one, Late Father, which um, again is a... Remember, remember we decided that it was going to be called... Oh, no, 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 no. You're my publisher for the last <laughs> yeah. one. So it's not you. And, uh, yeah, what, what were you going to say? I was going to ask about the title. Because the thing is cool is your titles are such good father. metaphors. Oh, thank Yeah, you. they are. Late Father and other poems. Late Father is the final mm -hmm. poem. It's the longest poem I ever wrote. I don't think I should read it here. It takes about 10 minutes to read. Um, but... Um, but the cover is is amazing, isn't it? Is it is it blurry? It's a little blurry, but blurry? I'll put it on the screen. Oh, you know, wait, no, let me. Um, can I? I can. I can turn yeah, off. Well, I have that, a document uh, cam. I'm showing it right now for everybody. Oh, you, yeah, okay, okay mm -hmm. got it. So, um, you might notice it's it's poems about my own late father, as well as becoming a father relatively uh, late in life. I'm 55, and I have a five year old and a three year old. So you might see the the child's hand. Um, holding on to the adult finger. Uh, but what you might not notice the first time is the coffin in the negative space. Oh, I didn't notice that, yeah. Of the hand. Now that's all you'll ever be yeah, able to you're see. you're right, you're right. But the, uh, the illustrator said, hey, when I was doing the first illustration, I noticed that the negative space looked kind of like mm -hmm. a coffin. So I can I can make that more like a coffin. Mm -hmm. Should I read a poem? Yeah, please do. All right. Um, this 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 book touches on my background um, as in I, I have just a tremendously privileged uh, background, uh, which makes me a kind of an oddity in um, at least in the poetry slam community. There weren't that many uh, trust fund kids mm -hmm. uh, writing their poems. Do you get any like um, like I, gruff about that? Do people? Oh yeah, all yeah. the time, all the time. Um, in fact, a, a, a friend of mine. Um, related that uh, a mutual friend of ours said, huh, I just found out that Taylor is rich. <laughs> He's like, what? How do you, how do you not know that? He's like, well, I'm, does everybody know that? He's like, the entire Poetry Slam community knows that Taylor grew up on Park Avenue and is a trust fund kid. She's like, I didn't know that. And then she said, I am so proud of the Poetry Slam community. He said, why? She said, because nobody makes fun of Taylor for being a rich boy. And he said, can, can I swear? You can say whatever you want. Yeah, yeah. He said, what the fuck are you talking about? People give Taylor shit all the time. About, yeah, yeah. The poetry um, community, I mean, um, is, is sort of, um, you know, anti-capitalist a little bit. And, um, you know, the, the 1% is not a, um, you know, it's a common target just in general. So... <laughs> My friend, my, my former second best friend, Kristen O'Keefe Aptowitz, uh, loves quoting uh, Ogden Nash, who said, if you want to know what God thinks about money, just look at the people he gives it to. <laughs> um, so, uh, you know, the, I always say the greatest gift that my parents gave me was was uh, the greatest gift my father ever gave me was loving, loving my mother. And um, so they, they stayed together. They both died quite young. Um and in fact, they both died within two weeks of the same age. Oh wow! They man. were five they were five years apart. Um, I do a lot of I'm I'm really into genealogy now and tracing my own ancestry and and realizing that, you know, everybody on Earth is 
a long lost cousin. Just some are some are longer lost than others. You know, first cousins. I have I have eight first cousins. Um, I'm not as in touch with my second cousins, but I've got about 25 of those. And third cousins, the average American has over a hundred third cousins. Oh wow! They've just they've just lost track of them, because who who has time? You know, your cousins are the are the grand are the other grandchildren of your grandparents. Your second cousins are the other grandchildren of your grandparents' brothers and sisters. Right? You all share a great grandparent. Mm-hmm. Who who knows? Who can keep track of the great grandchildren of your great grandparents' brothers and sisters? It's just. Third third cousins are fucking strangers to <laughs> you know, everybody. I, one like of my that. fondest memories of childhood is um, my, my mother's side is the Matthews family. And that we went to a Matthews family reunion. It was like a like a Eastern seaboard thing in some Pennsylvania campground with like a hundred relatives. We played like baseball and had a camp out. And that was like literally the best day of my life. I wish, um, you know, that kind of thing was something we did still. Maybe you can bring it back too. <laughs> <laughs> Um, there are a couple of families who who have competi- annual competitions to see who can have the biggest uh, family. Yeah, reunion. there is something cool though, just about you know having a connection to start with, even if you don't know them at all. You know, it's an interesting experience. Yeah. yeah. Well, I do. I like to do the opposite. I have an app on my phone um, that you know, if you say like, "Oh, I I have roots in in New England from the 17th century," I can say, "Oh, give me the name." an approximate death date of one of your grandparents. And um, I can press a button and see whether I'm related to that person too. And if it's a like an old New England um, family, um, or they're Dutch, they, or if they're Dutch uh, from old, old time New York, we're cousins, mm-hmm. you know? We're, I found 11th cousins. This, this, the, the app that I use is called Family Search, and it'll go up to 15th oh, cousins. Wow. And that, mean, that means That's the everybody. ancestor that you share <laughs> is, is like was born in 1480 mm-hmm. or something like that. But it's just great to find yeah, out. Yeah. That, uh, it, I feel like it's something that we should be reminding mm-hmm. each other of, you know, uh, every day. Yeah, yeah. So as a... Um, as a as a lucky uh, rich kid whose parents loved each other, um, I I often found myself um, wishing that bad things would happen to people I love so that I could have uh, stuff to write poetry about. And and I think that's not uncommon. I think that's not uncommon. Uh, um, people say, I'm you know I, I wish I want to write poetry. I want to write, uh, I, you know, like what. This might be a controversial thing to say, but but what's what um, the poems that that score well in slams? We are we are in a period in spoken word where we, it, it is very much about the, the poetry of survival. Mm-hmm. You know what? T- t- write write to us about what you, about what you have survived, and um, I. I, I well, I don't. I used to think I hadn't survived that much, and so I didn't have well, anything well, to write Well, if I'm understanding right, you're, both your mother and father died at age 25. No, 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 no. They both they died 25 years ago. They d- oh. both died at age 58. Ah. They were five, five years apart. Oh, I see. Okay, um, but they died within two weeks of the same mm-hmm. age. And I, you know, and I, my first wife died, and there's there's plenty that I have survived. Um, survive that's not really the kind of poem that i write but if i want to go down that road i i I can everybody is it's miraculous that anybody has survived Mm -hmm. but um, here's a sonnet from um uh, late father and other poems called sonnet disavowing my former invocation which page it is on page uh 82 and there are people it's it's popular these days to uh call any poem that has 14 lines a sonnet. Um, but for me, it's got to have a complicated rhyme scheme, you know, and uh, there are, contrary to to um, those who say, you know, oh, there's the Petrarchan sonnet and the Shakespearean sonnet, there are a lot of different rhyme schemes that you can, that you can throw at a sonnet. Um, but the difference between the Petrarchan and the Shakespearean is that the Shakespearean one ends with a couplet, a rhyming couplet at the end. 
Um, and so all of my all of my sonnets are are um, Shakespearean. And this one, um, if I'm doing my job right, the rhymes don't don't you know scream out at you. Um, but uh, but you're you're going to be showing everybody the the the, the lines, mm -hmm. so so they'll know. Uh, and maybe this one I will attempt to do uh, from memory, okay? And you can tell me whether I got it wrong. Uh, sonnet disavowing my former invocations. I should have rehearsed this first. I used to wish my life more full of pain, more rife with gold for poetry, less bland. I'd pray for lightning from some hurricane to hit my happy heart, would even raise my hand and me, 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 Strike me, I'd cry, I'd uh, I'd shout it. I'd, oh, God damn it, that's just not working. Me, me, me. Oh, please strike me, I'd cry, the way some bursting student might shout it. Please write, make someone in my family die so I might write great poetry about it. Oh, lightning, if you're listening, please disregard my former invocations and rain, please bless my simple little poems. They're plenty hard to write, and the world needs them no less. Let my family, if not my other works, outlive me. And to those who have survived real storms, forgive me. Hmm. The sonnet disavowing my former invocations from, from late father. I tried, I know that in an earlier draft, uh, I wrote that poem to my brother, hmm. my younger brother, whom I love. And uh, I think an early draft had the title like you know sonnet for my brother who i used to wish would die so that i could have something to write about and uh um and maybe it was having having children myself and realizing oh my oh my god i got wh why am i why do i wish that people around me would die you know i've had my share of tragedies i don't need any more like my, my friends in the slam community who really have survived or are battling have major battles to fight daily um, would think I was an idiot if I prayed for more uh, you know, strife in my life just to have something to write about. It's hard to write about happiness. Um, why do you, th why do you like think that is? It's definitely true. Because just go off and live your fucking happy <laughs> life, you know? Uh -huh. um, I think Naomi Shihab Nye is, does it, does, writes mm -hmm. about happiness eloquently. I, I think it's because the, a poem requires a problem. Like it's a kind of tool that transforms something. And if you don't have a problem, th there's no need for, for digging at the problem with a tool, you know? So it makes it so it, it doesn't really work for, for happiness. I don't know that I entirely agree with that, but, but, but I think you're onto something. It, it, it requires attention. Mm -hmm. It requires, yeah. uh, and, and a, you know, tension, things pulling in opposite directions. Jane, Jane uh, Hirschfield says that a, a, a poem should always want to pull in two different directions. That, that, that you can, you can call that a problem, but uh, I write poems that pull in two different directions, but the tension is not a problem mm -hmm. often, sometimes. Well, a sometimes. problem or maybe like a mystery or something, you know, something that you can't figure out, you know, it, it's. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Um, when I have a book called uh, uh, Bouquet of Red Flags that came out on uh, Right Bloody. And this was, um, I, I, I've, uh, I got married after Rebecca and that, marriage ended in divorce and this is my lsd book my love sex and divorce book and um i remember uh my my i was already in the process of getting divorced um it wasn't official yet um but we'd been you know separated for months and actually i'd already fallen in love again and so i was sitting with my journal and um and part of me was wallowing in my hurt. And the other part of me was excited to have found love again. And, uh, and I, I chastised myself and I said, no, you cannot write another line until you decide whether you're happy or you're heartbroken. <laughs> and then I realized, no, 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 that's, that's, um, stop being an idiot. It's because I am conflicted that I need to write this mm -hmm. poem. Exactly. You know? yeah, conflict. That's that, another, another important yeah, word. That's, there's yeah. there's mm -hmm. conflict and let yourself feel both things at one yeah, time. Yeah. yeah. Um, uh, I'll, I'll remember who said this in a moment. Um, uh, 
God damn it. He used to stand on his balcony at Oxford and recite the entire um, uh, wasteland from memory. Famous British poet. T.S. Eliot um, or someone else? No, no, okay. no, no, no. Uh, next, gener- next generation. Uh, uh, God damn it. Uh, just, you know, somebody in the chat will know. Um, uh, you know, he... He was my he was my the four weddings and a funeral is based on, hmm. on they they recite one of his poems. Damn. Yeah, I don't know. I and I've I've had this fall I've had this problem before. Um, but this wise this wise poet said that poetry can be described as a a a uh, the clear expression of mixed feelings. Uh, yeah. Not the opposite, not the mixed expression of clear feelings. I don't write a poem when I, I know exactly how I think about something and then give you wishy-washy uh, expressions of it. No, the clear expression of mixed of mixed feelings. I want to say uh, A.E. Hausman, but it's not but that. Um, suggestions are Ted Hughes, Dylan Thomas, Auden. Auden, um, that's okay. who it is, Auden. <laughs> Um, you know, Thank I you. always think of it too. Is um, what poetry does is sort of raise the resolution of our experience. You know, if you think of like life as pixelated, it's a way that we carve in and sort of divide up those big blotchy pixels into something sharper. Um, yeah, and I think that's the, the, that's the well process put. too. Um, but, there's something dressed. I mean, dr- uh, but to me, there's something very dressed up. There's dressed up. Uh, I try. I try to. I'm a very conversational poet. I know that uh, poets, you know, poetry does not have to conform to all of the rules of grammar. Nevertheless, mine usually does. And and the entire act of sorrow, I, I said, we can go back and look at it. But I think that first stanza, it's about 20 lines and it's all one sentence. I, I've done that. I have 200 word sentences that are uh, one one poem. I love playing with the with the grammar. I love the poetry of elegant syntax. And the, the poet Sarah Kay. Have you ever published Sarah Kay? We actually Kay? haven't. No. Oh well, she's too famous for you now. There's no way she'd send you. <laughs> yeah, a poem you got to tell now. her to submit. That's the the trick about Rattle is that we only publish people who submit. So we we don't yeah, solicit well, people. So um, if they don't, we don't publish them. <laughs> Get, so, I'll, but even I'll people like you know Ted Cooser or somebody will send poems. So, uh, you know, hopefully the people like Sarah Kay will get the get the hint and do it too. If anybody knows yes. her, let her know. <laughs> I, I know her. She said, "Well, tell her to her. send us some poems." Then I will. I will. Uh, uh, she she said once to me, um, "I have finally decided what it is I like about your poetry. I I can never decide when you're reciting a poem and when you're just hmm. talking." And I t- took that as such a compliment. I hope she meant it as a compliment. Um, well, I was actually thinking think the same thing, reading through your book. It's a, such a, it is a unique style to, um, I don't know, and that's a great way to put it, that, that it's, it's, it feels so casual and so, um, and so like just honest and like right to the what you're talking about, not, not being flowery and, and um, you know, not pulling out, um, you know, grand gestures, but sort of getting to the heart of it in a, in a direct way. Well, thank you. If you look on YouTube, there's a poem of mine called Any Language, Much Less English, about, it used to happen after my readings that people would come up and they'd be, since I have a, 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 one of my most well-known poems is called The the Impotence of Proofreading. And I wrote it using a spell checker. And it's about all the dangers that spell check can get you in if you think that spell check is a, is a substitute for proofreading, actually proofreading your paper. And so it's just littered, littered with misspellings, and they're dirty and they're funny. And and actually, that poem has gotten, uh, has been responsible for three middle school teachers losing their jobs in the last twenty what? years. Wait, you got to you uh, got to explain that. How would, how did people lose their jobs? It is not it is not an appropriate poem to give your seventh grade. <laughs> oh, they just say, angry parents. Yeah, let's read this poem and uh, edit mm-hmm. it using the marks of punctuation and editing that we've been studying in class. And, and they sent the poem home and, um, there's a, there's, it's, there's some dirty jokes and, and, uh, and, and three teachers in the last 20 years have lost their jobs yeah. for giving that, uh, well, giving that poem. You know, you, um, you were a teacher and you've done so much to champion teachers, of course, but you're not a teacher now. Um, is that part, or are you a teacher now? Are you still teaching? 
Well, it depends on depends on how you define. <laughs> okay. It. Well, uh, your your job is not teaching, and I don't. And... I don't I don't get my health insurance exactly. through a school. Exactly. Exactly. So, um, is, is that one of the reasons why you stopped? Then one of the things, um, that you know, few people ask to have poems removed from like our website and stuff. And the number one reason is because it's teachers, who parents have found the poem they wrote, and it was either sexual or just had profanity in it or something, and the parents got upset, and the the principal had told them get these people to take it off the internet or else you're going to be fired. And that's happened like three or four times. Um, does, does your, does, is that something that came up to you for you ever? Cause it's, um, it's a serious thing. Like if I were a teacher, I'd probably use a pen name at this point. Oh yeah. No, no, I definitely would too. I, yeah. definitely I mean, it's a different too. sort of era now um, where, you know, people get fired yeah. really easily. I think maybe 20 yeah. years ago, it wouldn't have been an issue, but, um, but now right. with, with social media, in the way that, that that all works, um, I think it'd be tough to be a teacher and be a writer at the I same heard time. When I I was teaching, uh, I used to teach on Cape Cod in the in the late '90s, and there was a teacher who was fired. Um, uh, he had had a long career <clears throat> as a actor in porn. Oh wow! And his videos were at the local, you know, blockbuster in the in the back room. But that's that's not why he was fired. Now nowadays, maybe it would be. Um, I think he I think he tried to convince one of his former students to to join him in a movie. Well, that, or something that would like be that. a problem. So it is <laughs> utterly, utterly a problem. Utterly a problem. In fact, I am retroactively going back and taking out my mention of this <laughs> yeah. of this story. Yeah. Well, uh, that's not that has nothing mm-hmm. to do with why I didn't teach anymore. Mm-hmm. Um, I I absolutely loved being a teacher. Um, and it was in, I wrote What Teachers Make, which you published, right, for the first time. Yeah, and actually, there's a funny story, which I don't know if I've told you or not, but, um, you know, I send my aunt, I have a few relatives, and my aunt gets a subscription to Rattle, and she's a teacher. She was a retired now high school math teacher, and when we published it, she wrote me an email and said, oh, my God, this Taylor Molly guy plagiarized this poem. I've read it before. Because it was being forwarded around so much on email that she recognized right. it and thought that you had stolen uh, your own poem. She's not the only yeah. one. She's not the only one. <laughs> I was reading in uh, Bahrain. I did one tour of the Middle East, maybe, maybe two. Um, and this teacher in Bahrain who heard me do what teachers make, make said, um, he said, I, I, I've I, read the original. I, I like what you did with it. But I, <laughs> you should probably say this is based on inspirational cyber spam <laughs> exactly um, what, an, what an honor to have a poem get uh, yeah a poem to, to outlive you know yeah. my, my name appears twice in that poem <laughs> you know you know be honest taylor what do you know what do you what do you make mm-hmm. and and then i call myself mr molly at least once in that poem but some well-meaning teacher and it's probably my fault because in 1999 i posted that poem on my brand new worldwide website <laughs> Um, which had lots of pages saying under construction and coming soon. And uh, I said, click here to see an example of one of my poems. And so you'd click the button and it took you to what teachers make. And I nowadays mm-hmm. I would know to s- put what teachers make by Taylor Molly between the title and the text <laughs> so that anybody Just copying and pasting, you know, yeah. cut, cutting and pasting would, would sandwich my name in there. And I think that's probably how for, for a decade, uh, my name got sort of disassociated mm-hmm. from that from that poem. What was I saying? Yeah, oh, so um, I was asking, like, um, why you became a teacher, and then why did why did you move on? Oh, I became a teacher because I went to Kansas State University to get my MFA in poetry, but I had to teach uh, as uh, that's what all the grad students did. We taught our own classes of freshman composition, and I found that I absolutely loved teaching. I graduated in '93. I, the slam uh, I hadn't discovered slam. Actually, I had discovered slam in '92. Um, it, slam was invented in '87 by Mark Smith. So what? But I um, I didn't think that you could be a professional spoken word poet. So I th- said, all right, I'm going to become a teacher. And uh, it's, you know, it, to the extent that that uh, being a poet and being a teacher, they, they share a lot. Um, I love quoting Horace, who said over 2000 years ago that the task of the poet is to either delight or instruct. 
and that the both the, the greatest poets can do both at the same time. And that is also the job of the of a of a teacher to delight and instruct. Uh, if you can, if not, you, you probably need to instruct a little bit more than you delight. Um, I I uh, I loved being a teacher, and. I started to get, I won the National Poetry Slam in 96, I was teaching. I won it again in 97, I was teaching. And I started to get invitations to come and read at places that were further and further afield from where I was teaching at that point in New York City. And this one guy called me up and said, what would it take to get you to come to my university, University of North Dakota, um, and, and read to my students in April, Poetry Month? And I said, oh, April, it's, it's, a bad, it's a bad time. I'll come in the summer. He said, no, I don't want you in the summer. I don't have my students in the summer. I want you in April. I'll give you, a, I'll give you $750. I was like, no, it's not about the money. I'll give you $1,000. It's not about the money. I'll give you $2,000 <laughs> plus airfare. And I, I ultimately couldn't do it. I mean, that's how you, that's how you negotiate. The, the way you truly find out what, you, what something is worth is you just say no, no, no. I don't want to do it. I can't. I can't do it. But it's two thousand dollars, and uh, I hung up the phone and 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 thought two thousand dollars. You know, I make twenty eight thousand dollars as a teacher. Now it's a little bit awkward for somebody whose most well known poem is about how dare you judge me for what I make to have made this calculation. If I do fifteen readings at two thousand dollars, I'll make more money as a poet. So in in June of two thousand, I said goodbye to my. Uh, sixth grade homeroom class, fully expecting that I was going to come back to teaching, that, that teaching would welcome me back like a lover who, um, who knew you wouldn't be gone for long. Uh, and it's just, uh, it's, it's worked out. It's worked out. But then again, you know, I've got this safety net. Uh, uh, so I wasn't ever going to starve. Uh, but it's, but it's worked out. Mm-hmm. And I very, I very quickly made more money. I mean, like, much more money as a poet than I did as a teacher, which unfortunately is not that hard. Um, mm-hmm. But also, I, I got lucky. I got lucky. Is the um, is Slam still sort of? Is there still that kind of touring with um, you know agents and stuff? I remember some friends of mine back when we were doing this Slam issue in two thousand seven. And a friend of mine came in like third or fourth place at one slam, and he ended up getting tours everywhere and making the same thing. Um, yeah, and he he made a living a uh, playing people. online poker and in touring and doing slam. And he quit his job. Yeah. And um, is that still something that goes on? I'm a little bit out of the loop with slam. I am too. I am too. I don't know. I don't think it's as big as mm-hmm. it used to be. Uh, the national poetry slam got sort of fell apart um, through infighting and yeah. and. I don't know mismanagement. I wasn't. I wasn't mm-hmm. there. Um, so there is no national slam. Oh, anymore, there is, okay. which means yeah. no. There's no. At least there's no national slam championship. Mm-hmm. So I don't know what. And my slam, uh, the NYC Urbana, went uh, lasted for 17 years, and then we. I think 2015 or 16 was the last mm-hmm. time we sent a team. And yeah, um, I have to look into that because I really, I it hadn't really occurred to me to look up what slam is doing now but i don't even know um yeah yeah it it was a great time though when it when it was running big and that um what do you think um sort of makes a slam poem versus a page poem i mean you do the page versus stage um and and i have my own theory which is probably offensive to all poets everywhere but um (laughs) (laughs) probably i'll probably offend everybody i'm good at that um, right. but, but to me, it feels like, like, like performance poetry is, is a communal act where you're like bringing sort of a bunch of consciousnesses together in sort of one emotional energy. Whereas, um, page poetry is more like a scalpel. It's this intimate thing. So it's like running in opposite directions in a weird way. I can't quite articulate, but there's like a religious sense or to a slam. Like I, you know, the slams I've been to are just amazing experiences, but they're, they're not like reading a book and an amazing poem. It's totally different. Because it's the energy yeah. of the collective. It's like a collective act. Um, so I don't know. What do you think about the, the difference, if there is one? Well, I don't. Uh, w- sometimes I, I, I'll be visiting a school. And, um, and I mean, I still, I, 
up until this year, you know, I still tour, but I'm no, it's no longer slam venues that I'm going to. I'm the visiting writer uh, at, at a school for a week. And so sometimes the English teacher will say, oh, I'd love for you to explain. We're, stu- we're, we're, we're studying slam poetry in class. I'd love for you to explain the difference between a slam poem and a regular poem. Mm. And uh, so the, the guy who invented the, the, the poetry slam, Mark Smith, said, I, I didn't invent an adjective. All right. I invented a noun. A slam is a thing. It's a way. It's a way of listening to poetry and making it fun, funner by scoring it, giving arbitrary, not arbitrary, but giving, you know, subjective scores to poems. You drop the high, you drop the low. And then the ostensibly the better poems, poets move on. And they, they usually do. Um so there's no slam is not an adjective. Mm-hmm. When people say slam poetry, what they mean is, you know, they probably mean fast paced, loud, well, well performed. Well, there's a, there's an evolutionary aspect because what is successful oh, works, you know, and then it evolves into an actual form. Because right. if it, you know, if it doesn't work, you don't, you know, it's a survival of the fittest. So it right. becomes it uh, comes a, it fills a niche, you know. Yeah. Um, it was something else I was going to say. Um, the slam. Oh, oh! When you go out and you pick the judges, mm-hmm. um, the the job of the bout manager or the or the MC before the slam begins is to go out and get a a, a good cross section of the audience and um, good mix of whoever is there. And you know, if one person says, uh, if you say, you know, why do you think you're qualified to be a judge? Well, I'm a professor of English literature at the local college and like, Oh, good luck with that. We're going to tell people that. And that's not going to go well for you. Um, but you know, people like I, you know, you get a couple to be a judge and like, sh- he hates everything. And I love everything. You're like, Oh, that's great. That's great. But when you're giving your little spiel to the judges saying you're here at a slam, um, you know, you're, you're supposed to give each poet a score between zero and 10 and you're, supposed to have five points for literary merit and five points for how well the poem is performed. So a 10 is supposed to be a perfectly written poem performed perfectly. That's never the way it works out. I'd say nine times out of 10, a brilliantly performed mediocre poem will beat out the mediocre performance Mm -hmm. of a brilliant poem. We can argue about whether that's a, a uh, tragedy or not, it is it, it is a completely different skill set to perform a poem well, and uh, I think actually poets are to blame for part of why poetry, you know, became uncool in the in the twentieth century. Like Longfellow, uh, Henry Wadsworth Longfellow, in his day, was like a literary superstar. There is no one in uh, in the literary world, maybe J.K. Rowling, who, who could compete with, with Longfellow uh, in his day for popularity. Mm-hmm. You have to go into the sports world to find people. And, and you know, I blame T.S. Eliot for saying poetry should be difficult. You know, you, you, you go around telling people that a poem is not cannot be an easily understood thing. A poem needs to be something you need to go to school in order to understand. You're going to end up with people writing poems mm-hmm. like that. And so part, part of part of uh, the job, I, I feel like the part of the job of any poet these days is to be a proselytizer for poetry. So everybody needs to have a couple of poems in their back pocket that um, that will win people mm-hmm. over to the art form. The 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 more you you know the curse of knowledge. Have you ever heard of about the curse of knowledge? Uh, the the more you know about something, the harder it is for you to remember what it was like before you knew it. And um, the the worst, the baddest, the baddest, the baddest thing about poetry is that the more you study poetry, and look, you must know this in your position. The, the more refined your palate gets and the more you get to appreciate uh, the texture of a finely wrought 
poem, but that's not going to be the poem that wins somebody mm -hmm. over. And it's probably not going to do well in a slam. Mark Smith always thought that the poetry slam was a way to win people over. And you see the evolution in poets who come to the slam. They come to the slam and then in the beginning, their poems are, are, are very slammy. And after they've been there a while, you can see an evolution <clears throat> in a venue. Venues that have been around a long time, they don't fall for the same tricks mm -hmm. and histrionics of, of poets who, who get up there. And, but like there are... The longer that a poetry slam venue has been around, the more literary they become, the more paged mm -hmm. they become, and made the, although they may have started stage. Yeah, it's interesting. With Rattle, I don't know if people know, but how we work is that me and Megan read all the poems. And we have that problem where we read so many poems that we don't fall for you know, things anymore. And, and you're, you're sort of drawn to things that are just strange because it's like, wow, there's something I haven't seen before. But then we have Alan, um, who only reads the submissions that we bring him doesn't read any other poetry in any other phase of his life. And um, so he's sort of our... And he probably says to you guys, what the <laughs> fuck are you bringing Well, me? knowing, exactly, Where's... knowing that I have to show it to him, in, in the back of my head, I know, like, if it's going to fly or not. And that, that sort of grounds right. the whole enterprise because um, we have him back there keeping us real or whatever. Um, I'm not yeah. moving along very well. We need to get some more poems. Okay, in. Okay. Let's, um, okay. let's right. maybe do... I don't know if they're shorter, maybe two poems, and then we'll take questions okay. from the audience. Oh, okay. we got to do the metaphor dice, too. Okay, we can talk yeah. about the metaphor um, dice. Yeah, so, so, I don't know, can you stay a little longer, a little extra? Um, I don't, I, don't, I forgot how long you're I was supposed to be to an hour, here, so. so we should have like 10 oh, minutes okay. left, but, but we got to do the metaphor dice no, no, and no. some more poems, too, so. All right, here's a poem that'll win people okay. over to poetry. What page? It's called Ode to Lawn, it's on page 72, okay. Ode to Lawn Darts, <laughs> or... What could possibly go wrong? Do you know, uh, if you don't know what lawn darts are, then you must be uh, uh, 35 or younger. <laughs> uh, they, they don't make them anymore. Uh, they were just like darts, but much bigger. And kids were getting killed. Uh, like zip lines. Uh, they, I think they've recently started making zip lines again. And uh, the slip and slide they had to get rid of. And uh, this poem is about our changing relationship to danger. Ode to lawn darts. O oh, deadly metal pointed hail, O oh, perfectly balanced mini spears begging to be thrown, can you hear the sirens calling us out to play? Or are those just regular sirens singing us all the way to the emergency room? O oh, sibling syringe, an end to summer evening fun, ill advised after dinner games and contests, all beginning with the same five fateful words. I have a great idea. Let's make this interesting. It'll be just like tag with one twist. It's basically capture the flag, but the stakes are higher and made of metal and actual stakes. Here, you close your eyes. Here, don't move an inch to the right or left. Here, we'll spin you around on the tire swing, then you try to pin the tail on the donkey. What could possibly go wrong? Let's play a game. It's called lawn dart baseball. It's called red light, green light, lawn dart. It's called Marco Polo <gasps> pool darts. What can I say? I have a gift for great ideas. They just strike me in the back of the head out of nowhere. Oh, lawn darts, we miss the deadly playthings of our youth. Where have all the splintered seesaws gone? Where have the squeaking swing sets with chains? Where are the squeaking swing? This is so hard to say. Where are the squeaking swing sets with chains thinned by rust and gentle slabs and slabs of gentle stone that broke our falls? You taught us fun and fear and consequence. And those of us who survived paid for that knowledge and stitches. And those who did not, well, we miss you too. <laughs> that was Ode to Lawn Darts, or, or What Could Possibly Go Wrong from Taylor's newest book. Um, Daniel Mass says it, he feels the same way about uh, pinatas, like blindfold a kid and give him a bat. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. That, 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 yes, absolutely. I should have put piñatas in here. <laughs> Um, yeah, we just had a birthday party the other day with the pinata, and boy, that that's a little <laughs> a little dicey Everybody too. Stand, stand back. Um, do you want to read another one? We got to get some more poems in before sure. we do other stuff. 
Okay. All right. Um, when the pandemic started, uh, my family and I l left Brooklyn and went up to the uh, summer house that I used to go to on weekends and summers up in Connecticut that we call it Kickbox. Um, I, I won't tell you why. It's just that's the name of the house. I, I come from the kind of family that likes to name their houses. And um, as I said, my dad died in 1990, and uh, there was so much that he did for the house that um, that my mother realized that shit, shit wasn't getting done, that she never realized had to get done. You know, like the gutters were suddenly overflowing with leaves. So, so about two years after she, she he died, my mother instituted a, a family gathering called Work Weekend, where we would all get together and, uh, and, and do what needs to be done to winterize the house or open it up. And uh, my mother died, you know, five years after my father. But the, the, the tradition of work weekend is something that we have still um, maintained as the family has grown. Uh, and anyway, this poem is called Work Weekend. On what page? It is page three. The autumn after my father died, the trees in their grief dropped their leaves and refused to rake them up. That winter, the stone walls, as if by frost, toppled their top stones in protest at his loss. The firewood stayed stacked in the forest, burning in its rotten sadness, and never reappeared in the shed the way it always had when he was alive, and the gutters filled with leaves and overflowed their tears in thunderstorms. Meanwhile, inside the house, Mice were so devastated by his death that they dove headfirst into the traps that he had set for them and just stayed there, too grief-stricken to often offer their bodies to the dark. So my mother invented Work Weekend. Two times a year, when we would meet at this old barn we call Kickbox to do what needs to be done, she, now gone, almost 20 years as well. We have, regardless, grown in numbers, love and chores, and so still meet these two times in spring and fall to put up storm windows or take them down, cut, split, and stack firewood, clean gutters, and tick off the million unchecked items on love's list of things that must be done, as if this time they would stay done forever, as if this time we would want them to, as if it were this house alone that needed care. And that was Work Weekend from Taylor's newest book, Late Father and Other Poems. Um, Taylor, let's talk about these um, metaphor dice, which we I've had fun with before. Um, I didn't have the heart to tell you, you already sent me one copy, which I used at the Literary Festival last year. So I actually have two copies now. Did I send you the erudite um, edition? I can't remember. And actually, a teacher friend of mine still has my copy. Um, cause she borrowed it, and then COVID came and never gave it back. But um, so now oh, I have this oh. one. Um, so so oh, I'll show, show it, it on show screen. It. So these are Taylor's metaphor oh. dice, which is a teaching tool that he developed. Um, right here, Taylor Molly's metaphor dice. Roll, write, repeat. And um, there are these dice... It's not too bright. You can see the different words on the dice. Um, so how did this come about, Taylor, and, and what is it? Metaphor dice is a, a – it came about because I teach poetry workshops to kids who don't want to be there sometimes. And I was doing a lesson where you have uh, abstract nouns and adjectives and concrete nouns on the board, and you pick one, and it creates a metaphor. And this girl was not really part of the lesson and I said, well, you know, why aren't you participating? And she said, I'm really more of a math science person. And I said, and I don't know where this came from, but I said, that's okay, because a metaphor is an equation between a big concept and a small idea and a small thing. And she, her eyes perked up at, at equation. And I said, like, here, pick, pick, pick three words from the board. And she said, my father, broken, mirror. 
And I said, okay, so you got to just supply a couple of words. My father is a broken mirror. If you said that, nobody would think that you meant that literally. That's a metaphor. That's what a metaphor is. A temporary equation between something that's big and hard to talk about, maybe means a lot of different things to different people, and something smaller and tangible. And then your job is to sort of tell people how, this tr how it's true. How is your father a broken mirror? And she said, I think I can do that. And I said, okay, I'm, I'll check around with other people. I'll come back to you in five minutes. Use the phrase, which is to say. I came back in five minutes, and this is what she had written. My father is a broken mirror, which is to say he's been shattered into a thousand pieces. He's hard to handle without cutting yourself. My mother says he's seven years of bad luck, but I can still recognize my own reflection in all of his thousand shards. Oh, wow. Now, I... I I may have, I may, have, that's the way I remember it. That's the way I tell yeah, the story. Is, I think I may have stuff, changed it. But I, that was when I realized this is such a great activity. There's got to be a way that I can jump into this activity without spending 25 minutes telling people, you know, give me, give me abstract nouns and concrete nouns, then having to explain what the difference between a concrete noun and an abstract noun is. And that's uh, when I decided I've got to come up with words put the words on dice oh i have i have the blurred yeah uh, to keep it in front uh, of you yeah background. i have to keep it in front of me and my face <laughs> so the reds you roll them and then you uh and then you arrange them red white and blue um i'll just come up with a metaphor uh this is the vocabulary set where, where the the uh, the words are a little bit bigger my own demise will be a stingy experiment mm -hmm. um so, so the shadow the shadow is a feckless junkyard. And these are all just supposed to jumpstart jump start you, give you an idea. And so these, these have been around. The original set uh, came out in 2018. And then the advanced vocab set, the erudition edition, came out in 2019. And now I'm going back. The original idea, I made them out of paper. This is oh, one wow. of the original paper metaphor guys. And... Kids would, would cut out the dice, which takes a long time, and then tape them together. So now my, what I'm doing is creating a, a metaphor dice, a card, mm -hmm. where uh, my words are on one side so that you can, you can sort of explain, okay, oh, I see the reds are the concepts and the whites are the adjectives and the blues are the objects. And they get to fill out, there's one blank on this side, but then the other side is all all blanks and they will be using a die cut have you ever used a die cut mm -mm, for uh yeah. no that's what you that's what um anything that is pre-perforated oh, okay. mm -hmm. so is is cut on a on a die cut so the kids will easily be able to just this is a prototype uh cut them out fold these into uh, on, on one side are my words this this is a these will be pre-creased, and that creates a die. And there, that's got my words on it. But if you fold it the other way, it's blank. Mm -hmm. And they're made in America, and you don't have to pass out scissors. And and they're going to be, whereas the original metaphor dice that are sold on Amazon um, are are twenty bucks. These are going to be like two dollars for a set. Maybe I'll get a, a teacher mm -hmm. set. You get thirty for twenty five bucks. Oh, let me let me um, let me talk about one of the things that we do on Metaphor Dice is uh, you can still see me and hear yep. me even though I've gone into yep, my you can. You're good. into my settings. Mm -hmm. um, one of the things we do is give away a lot of sets uh, to to teachers. Oh, I'm in my settings. I don't know how to get back, but I can see you're you. Yeah. Yeah, you're you're good. Um, this QR code, if you shoot it. Uh, it'll take you to a page where you can sign up to get a set of metaphor dice uh, for free. Um, when anybody buys a set of metaphor dice for 20 bucks uh, uh, on, on our site, metaphordice.com, they have the option of buying another set for $7 that we promise we will send to a teacher. Um, so, and we've given away over a thousand sets like oh, that's that. That's cool. And currently, Currently, there has been a glut of, of uh, generosity, and I have a dearth of, of teachers who have signed up 
uh, to, to receive a free set, which actually costs a dollar. But uh, if you if you if you have the type of um, if you've activated that feature on your phone, you should be able to shoot that QR code and be able and be taken immediately to a page where you can sign up to get a, a free set of metaphor dice. It usually takes me about a week or two to send a, out the free sets. But that's awesome. Thanks, Taylor. And uh have you let me keep i guess i got to keep you on screen here so people can flash that um do do you have any i'd love for i'd love for somebody to say it worked leave a comment yeah yeah leave a comment and say it worked if it does we're wondering if it if you can actually capture a qr code on the screen like that um and my phone isn't working right now so Try it. (laughs) Um, So you don't. You must be using your phone to monitor something. Oh, I'm using my phone to sling um, this broadcast out to Periscope. So you have to use apps for some things. Um, But but um, I was going to ask you: Do you have any poems in the book by any chance that that were written from metaphor dice, or or any poems that you that you could share how Uh, it worked? I got one off the top of my head. I wrote this using metaphor dice. I rolled my father, gentle hero, superhero. My father was a gentle superhero, which is to say he had the strength of 10 men, great fathers all. And he never used his x-ray eyes on me. He never flew away. He never turned invisible. Even now, I still think I see him everywhere. Oh, wow. That totally could have gone in late father. Yeah, yeah. Um, a beautiful poem. I got a couple of a couple of other ones. Um, they work well for just like jumpstarting your daily writing pra- practice. Mm-hmm. They work well for like epigrammatic uh, poems. They work well for poems where you know the central trope of the of the poem is a is a metaphor. Yeah. Well, I should have done. Maybe I'll do it. Actually, yeah, I'll do that. So we have a prompt every week, and I had a prompt lined up. But it didn't occur to me. I'll roll the metaphor dice, and that will be our prompt for oh, next yeah. week. Yes. So actually, I'll do yeah, that right you now. Do that. I'll do that okay. right now. So you take a red, a white, and a blue. Oh, what? no, no, no! Why don't you roll all the reds? All the reds. And I'll talk you through it. Roll all the reds. Roll all the reds and tell me how what what, what four they are. Uh, well, I have six reds or five reds. Six oh. reds. Oh, okay. So you've combined a couple of. I sets. don't know. That's what okay, I. Okay. Roll, 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 roll them all. Okay. Rolling them all. And we have, I tried to do another thing so it wouldn't be too loud in everybody's ears. Here it is. So we have um, Bullying, which was written in, I think, or with a sticker. We have oh, I sent you The, the Mind. Sticker. We yes. have Hope, Guilt, right. Memory Is, and Death. Ooh. Most of the reds don't have a verb attached to mm-hmm. them. But, but but some of them do because I need to have some dice that are face up in the box when you open ah. it and I want to be able to show people and if you have the verb there and uh, most of the white dice which are the adjectives don't have an article my father the dice say my father broken mirror um, but what's more useful is if to to like look at it and instantly get what the dice was supposed to do it would be my father is a broken mirror. And so a couple of them, memory is, mm-hmm. I remember using the, using the verb, the, the newer set, uh, has, has more of those. Uh, and those are the, those are, that's the facade of the dice that I put face up. Um, but I think with your permission, sure. I think in these, in, especially with fires and vacancies, mm-hmm. um, we need to write about hope. So let's let's choose hope. What is okay, hope? hope? Now go straight to the blue. Straight to the blue. And let's yeah, straight okay. to the blue. And we're gonna what is hope? Okay. So hope is the concept, that's the abstract now. Okay. And now we're gonna pick up an object and that will be what okay, hope so is. Go roll ahead. in these. Oh, I dropped I dropped one. I'm just gonna leave that. We have five. <laughs> okay. You could say whatever it is on the floor, that's the one. But okay. it, it's, it fell what behind the printer, blues? so I don't want to okay. take it out right now. <laughs> what are your five okay, blues? so the five blues are um meadow. Hope is a meadow. Quiz. Okay. Hope is a kind of quiz. Mirror. All right. Hope is a kind of mirror. I love the mirror. Epiphany. Yeah. Hope is an epiphany. Does epiphany comes from the from the vocab set, the erudite expansion set. Scourge. Oh, a scourge. Yeah, that's interesting. And a curse. Not not all 
not all the words uh, in the vocab set. I call it the vocab set. I swore that I this was supposed to be called the erudition edition, but I never told the graphic designer to make that change. So it's called the erudite expansion. Um, there were a bunch of different directions we could go for the for the ex first expansion set, but uh, perhaps because a lot of my my followers are teachers. The, they said, no, we just want bigger, better words. So it's a slightly smaller set, nine dice as opposed to 12. Slightly smaller number of dice, but slightly bigger words. Scourge, feckless, gratuitous, capricious. Um, uh, so, but what was the last one? Hope is a, a kind curse. of... A, hope is a kind of curse. Can we go sure, with that? Sure, let's go with that. Okay. And now roll the white dice, which are the adjectives, and that's going to tell us what kind of curse it is. Okay. And of course, whatever sent, whatever gets you writing, you know, don't feel like you have to use any of these words. One of the best things you can ever hear is a student say, "Wait, do I have to do that? Because I think I just got a better idea." Okay. Well, let's do it. This okay, is what are your, uh, what are your so we have dice? broken. Hope is a broken curse. Yeah, we have stingy. Yeah. An obstinate. Okay. Vacant. Divided. Right. A divided. Gentle. Person. And last minute. Now the reason I didn't the reason why I don't have the verbs on the on the red dice is because it makes it harder to to mm -hmm. to pull a Mary Oliver. You know Mary Oliver's poem Wild mm -hmm. Peace? Yeah. You do not have to be good. You do not have to drag yourself through the desert on your hands and knees repenting. You only have to let the soft animal of your body love what it loves. That totally could have been written using metaphor dice, where the body would be the red, right? What is the body? The body is an animal. Okay, now roll the adjective. The body is a soft animal. Uh, but she switches it around, the soft animal of your body. So we've got hope is like a, a divided curse. You know, you can also say the divided, who here knows nothing of the divided curse of mm. hope. But if you have, if you put the verb on the die, it makes it harder. You have that to makes, sort of ignore yeah, the verb. Yeah. So I'm going to let you, I, I bullied you into, <laughs> into the first, well, into let's the red do, and the blue. Uh, let's, let's ask people at home. Uh, first person okay. to say what they want it to be of these ones gets to, gets to pick. Okay. Remind us, remind us. Yeah. The so so once again, have. we have broken, stingy, obstinate, vacant, divided, gentle, and last minute. So I'm going to look. So Lakshmi says vacant. Um, let's see what else we have. We have, um, oh, vacant. Caitlin says vacant too. Vacant it is. We're going to okay. do it vacant. Okay. Hope is a vacant, hope is a vacant curse. There That's you go. Be great. Hope is a vacant the curse. Vacant and you'll have to tune in for sure next week, Taylor, to see what poems people come up with. Absolutely, hope I will. Hope is a vacant Absolutely. curse. There's the... There's the, and I won't even forget, like half, I don't know if you've seen the show is where I forget to tell people what the, the <laughs> what the prompt is for next week. It's always like, oh, I'm, the show's done. And then I, oh yeah, I forgot that. So now we know. Oh, Hope is a vacant right, curse right. is uh, next week's prompt. I'll tell you things that I forgot. I forgot to mention uh, that I would be doing this. Um, uh, I, I do a broadcast, a live broadcast on mm -hmm. Facebook. Find me on Facebook uh, uh, every Monday at noon Eastern time. That might be a little early. Well, 9 a.m. Yeah, get, yeah, get, get your, your blood coffee. going. Yeah, yeah 9 a.m. Um, I started it during the pandemic, doing it every every mm -hmm. day, and I get about um, uh, it, it's it's never more than a hundred, mm -hmm. uh, but uh, many of the same people show up every day, and and uh, um, but now it's Metaphor Monday, oh, okay. and uh, I, I put it in the description like, hey, it's Metaphor Monday starting right now, and tune in tomorrow where I'll be talking to Tim Green on Rattle. But then I, I totally, I meant to mention it uh, when I was... <laughs> well, give them a link, and then they can tune back. Um, oh, I'm uh, Taylor Molly, parentheses, the poet. Taylor Molly, the poet on Facebook. Okay, let's close out with right. one last poem, Taylor. I don't know what you want to finish okay. with, but... Um, Let's finish. Oh, with you know what? Let me let me. Um, an old friend of mine uh, just died uh, the day before Ruth Bader Ginsburg, um, and she was not doing well. She didn't die of um, COVID, but um, it was a long, slow decline. And so, this is a new poem. I, it's a. 
unpublished, but only for another month mm -hmm. or so. It did. This is one of my poems that got accepted during the quarantine. And it is called When the Answer to Every Question is Yes. Anybody who has had an a elderly parent will, will know, I, and I have not had an elderly parent, but anybody who's had to deal with someone having a sl long, slow slide into dementia will know that they're, they go through a period where they can really only answer every question with yes or no, or maybe just one of those, and then that gets taken away. So this is from my, my, uh, my friend Ingiard, and this is uh, when the answer to every question is yes, and thank you for having me. Too often comes a time when those we love have lived past the power to answer more than yes or no to any question. And so we simply change the questions from how are you feeling today to would you like a little more water? And if we forget and accidentally ask something more complicated like where does it hurt today? They may look at us and smile and say yes or no, to remind us that's all they can manage, or else, by then, it always hurts everywhere. And even beyond this time, there is another, when half of what little they still have is taken too, and the answer to every question must be yes, as in, do you know how much I love you? Would you like me to read you another poem? Or shall I come visit you again soon? Or as it is for some, and this is somehow worse to me, the answer must always be no, for they remember only how to refuse and deny, which seems a greater curse. Even so, the questions can change to become, for example, are you done with this water? And aren't you tired of me reading all these poems? No? Well then, I guess I can stay for another hour. And lastly comes the time when there are no answers, only listening and the holding of hands, which is a part of prayer. And lastly, only breathing, only air. And I think that that must have worked, the QR code, because I just got an order of somebody who signed up as a teacher. Excellent. Carla Schwartz, Carla Schwartz, your order went through, so uh, I got it. And she, and uh, and you have a note. If it does not fit in the mailbox, um, leave the package in the shed. Okay, uh, we got awesome. it. We got it, Carla. Do you know Carla Schwartz? Um, she calls or? in sometimes to share a poem. She um, lives in a houseboat half the year and um, travels all over. So it's always fun when she calls to see where she is. Um, right. Right. Yeah, so Taylor Molly, thanks so much for sharing all those poems. Oh, can you say what? Po uh, where is that about to be published, that poem you just read? Mm, I would if I could remember. Um, you, you, you do your outro, I'll find okay. it. Well, um, yeah, so, so that was Taylor Molly. Uh, thanks, thanks to everybody who um, joined in and shared your comments. A lot of comments in the, um, in the streams. What do you got? Uh, no, no, I still haven't found it. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Well, we'll put it in the, in the show notes or something later if you let me know. Okay. All right. But um, yeah, thanks so much, Taylor. It's been great talking to you and um, looking forward to seeing what, what uh, the metaphor dice come up with for next week's prompt. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye, yeah, everybody. Bye. Have a good one. Okay. So that was Taylor Molly. And um, and once again, the, uh, the prompt for next week is going to be uh, Hope is a Vacant Curse. So, so um, really looking forward to seeing what everybody comes up with for that. Now, um, once again, Taylor Molly um, was the 2017 Rattle Chapbook Prize winner um, for the Wedding Stone. Um, it's one of the just a, a tearjerker of a book. Um, and then his newest book is Here, Late Father from uh, Quirkus Review Books. Um, and you can find all of his work at taylormolly.com. That's Taylor, like you'd think, Molly, M-A-L-I, like the country, like his shirt. Um, and that was Taylor Molly, a great guest, really wonderful to talk to him. And, and the metaphor dice are such cool, cool concept. We did it at the um, Literary Festival last year. We had a, a writing workshop where we used them. Um, they're a lot of fun. So I hope teachers uh, pick up their free copies and stuff like that. Now, um, for today's prompt, let's move over to the open mic section. And before we do, I should say, um, 
Um, here are the numbers. Uh, if you haven't sent your poem yet, you can send it to openmic at rattle.com, all one word. Uh, if you um, want to call over Skype, all you do is send me a chat message to Rattle Poetry, all one word, through Skype, and I'll call you back when the time is right. If you'd just like to call over phone, the number is 818-850-7727, and uh, just let it ring a few times. It'll appear on my call screen, and I, once again, I'll call you back when the time is right. And we have about 34 minutes until I have to go. Um, and we have, who do we have who already asked on? We have, uh, let's we have an, oh, Lakshmi Nair is here. Um, so we'll call her. We have Richard Westheimer, uh, Brent Stauffer, um, Diane Knox, Danny Mass, Cameron Gray, Angela Gartner. So hopefully we can get to everybody. I'll try to be quick. I wrote a really short poem for our prompt this week. Um, and... Before we do that, let me check over. So this is um, this is the fire that's going on. Um, right there, if you can see it. Uh, and if it goes over that ridge, we're in trouble. But it's not. So okay, so we can keep doing the show. Um, let's see. Okay, yeah, I refreshed it. We're still good. Now um, let's see. So the the prompt for this week was to go oh there it is okay the prompt for this week was write a poem from the point of view of an animal and um it's a pretty easy one for me we have in addition to a fire and a construction zone in our yard if you could hear the beeping and digging in the background we also have um a mountain lion or cubs in our yard pretty much every night for the last couple weeks and um so we're going to a, an outhouse because of the uh the, the issues we got going. So I'm out there with a flashlight in the middle of the night, hoping not to get eaten by a mountain lion. And that was the inspiration for this poem. It's a really short one. It's uh, from the point of view of a mountain lion. And uh, here we go. This is Mountain Lion. She slinks in the shadow of the shed, thinks, not much meat in a man. He's not worth it to eat. That's my little short poem, Mountain Lion. It's probably true. Um, hopefully it's true. And uh, Megan, of course, wrote a much better poem than I did. And this is Megan's poem, uh, Horse Decides. And then she wrote it after an article. Um, let me make sure I can fit it on screen. Hang on one second. I got to shrink this somehow. Where's the little bar to shrink it? Okay, there we go. More shrinking. There we go. Okay, so this is Horse Decides, and, and there's an article that she was writing after. A West Virginia colt went off the rails Thursday night and completely bailed out of a race. He was about to win by a huge margin. So best guess is that the horse just thought he was going back to his barn, Track Vice President Eric Zinni said Friday. They certainly can be creatures of habit. So that's the article that inspired Megan's poem written from the perspective of a horse, I assume. And this is Horse Decides. Is it so difficult to conceive that my head is full of wild dreams, too? I feel the same thunder in my chest. I see the same greens and blues. It wasn't the barn I wanted, that bland bit of land. I didn't want to go back. Why do humans think the whole goddamn world is their track? I love the music of my own body pounding the tender ground. But then there's a wide sky, a strange smell. I'm spellbound by what I see and what I don't. Sometimes a choice is made by your bones and it's your life that follows. Maybe I strayed for you. Now you know it's possible to exit your tangled mind, to wake up from your strangest dream and follow it blind. But you'll go back to sleep and wake to a calendar square. I admire it, really, your lists, your tidy despair. They certainly can be creatures of habit, you say, and tread the crumbling path your feet have worn away. That was Megan's poem, Horse Decides. Um, now let's see what your poems were this week. Um, let's see, let me move over to... Uh, once again, email your poem if you haven't yet to openmic at rattle.com. I'm opening that right now, and I see a bunch of poems from a bunch of people. Um... Let's see. So, I'll, yeah. 
let's see who was up first. Let's do um, let's do Danny Mask first. So the phone is ringing. I'll get Danny's poem up. I thought I saw it. Oh, there it is. Yeah. Hey, Danny, how you doing today? I'm good. Hang on. I, I kind of what is going on? Oh, I got to bring you in. There you go. So, so you're doing good. Um, so, so what Great animal did you, tonight. what's that? Great show tonight. Yeah, that was a lot of fun. Um, I, I feel like a little weird with all that's going on, but, but I guess it's working on. Okay. Um, yeah, no, I'm trying to hold it together. Fire, the fire, <laughs> my God, over the ridge. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. On. Yeah. I think I was feeling good a couple of days ago and then I'm feeling a little worried again, but we'll see. We'll see how it goes. It, yeah. kind of, it jumped a line that, that I was hoping it would con be contained yeah. in. And um, so I'm actually oh going to be up late checking that, and then Megan will be up early, and, and we won't die by fire, hopefully. <laughs> so <laughs> so um, what is your, your – you wrote about a cat. That's all. <laughs> yeah. Cat's conscious yeah, choice. This is, uh, yeah, this is cat's conscious choice. I, I, think, I think the poem is pretty self-explanatory. Okay, well, go ahead whenever go. you're ready. Yeah. When my long, pointy ears pass through the jagged hole in the broken window, my mouth flashes white like a bowed bundle of tiny ivory handle knives stuck deep in red meat. Full of inaudible hissy language, my small mouth easily spreads open. My slanted, glistening eyes are the same color as the moonless night, forever poised between recurrent hunger and the confirmation of your hatred for my kind. Offended, you howl when you see me. It seems nothing matters more to me than eating food you leave at the bottom of your bowl. Excellent. That was Cat's Conscious Choice by Danny Mass. Thanks so much for sharing that, Danny. Excellent poem. Thank you, Tim. I appreciate what you do, man. Thank you. Yeah, always my pleasure. Thanks. Have a good night. Yeah, so this is going to be fun seeing what everybody wrote about. Um, let's see. Who should we do? Let's do Angela next. Angela Gardner. Um, yeah. See if we can get her on video. Hey, Angela. How are you doing tonight? Good. How are you? I was just listening to another poem. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they do pop up quick. I got to remind everybody every time that it, it comes from the future. It's a good reminder to do that because it, there's a 30-second delay as it slings around the internet. Um, I'm so getting you, quicker, though. So. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you are. That was quick. Um, and actually, you can tell, um, you know, especially with the regular callers, I, I have to edit the um, audio later. And I always delete the little gaps as we're waiting. And they're getting a lot shorter. Like, everyone's getting better at, <laughs> at doing it quick. I'm getting better at, like, calling people quick. And um, everyone's getting better at jumping on. So we're good to go. It's a lot less editing than it was early on. Um, so you did koalas. Koala mom's yeah. dreams. And I even have a picture with the koala because, and I'll say this real quick because I, you don't want to get people in, but um, I, for my job, I was able to go behind the scenes because our zoo had a, um, a joey, a baby koala is called a joey, everyone. I learned this. Um, so a, a joey was born. I was able to go behind the scenes and take pictures of like, you know, get him like come him or her, they don't know yet, coming out of the pouch. So oh, wow. it's. So um, I have the picture with it, too, but it's just about koalas sleep a lot, and it's about, like, the mom, the koala's dreams, so. Yeah, I, lo I love koalas. Okay, go ahead whenever whenever you're ready. Okay. So that's my picture, by the way, so <laughs> I took that picture. Um, koala mom's dreams. My baby is moving in the pouch, filled with milk, safe and sound. His furry body wiggles for a way out, but I gently nudge him back down. Sitting quietly on a branch next to finished webs, I hear noises from creatures with two legs, operating the big destroying machines, tearing into dirt and cutting our trees. I try to climb to safety, but fall in a trap. There is a cage, I'm pushed inside. The comfort suckling makes me softly cry. A thought of sweet leaves in the breeze puts my fearful mind at ease. I bellow as I wake hungrily. One of us is staring back at me. Oh, thanks. That was a great picture and a, and a great poem. That's the thing about koalas. It just seems like they have the life. Like, what do they... 
<laughs> you know, I mean, if you could come back and there was a reincarnation, like be a koala. <laughs> I know they love to sleep. And the funny thing about them is, um, well, not the funny, but like, they're just so cute. And I wasn't supposed to like, um, say anything when I went in there and I was like, Oh, they're just so cute. But, (laughs) but I mean, they, they're, um, in Australia, you know, you know, where they live, like they're being just, you know, a lot of, um, trees are being Mm -hmm. destroyed and stuff. And, you know, people are coming into them and they just like chilling in the trees. They're solitary. They're just like chilling out and, you know, we got to protect the koalas. So, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we definitely do. Well, thanks for sharing that, Angela. Great, great to see that. Thank you. Have a great night. You too. Bye. Okay. Um, let's see. Let's call up uh, Lakshmi Nair. I have to put her phone number on when we're done. But I'll find her poem for for right now. Let's see. Here it is. Hi, how you doing tonight? Good. Good program. Thank, Thank you. you. Yeah, I'm glad it's all hanging together. I was a little worried. <laughs> so, what animal did you write from the perspective of? Well, it's actually a bird. It's duck. Oh, okay. Um, so, yeah. Um, the name of my poem is "My Neck Is in Your Plate." Interesting. Okay, let's hear it. Whenever you're ready. Okay, I'm ready. Um, My neck is in your plate. I lend her my slender neck. Beak to beak, we swam in the lake on golden days. We caught worms, fed each other. Those were the days, I sighed, sticking my neck out from your plate. It hurts but to be a cruel food. Sitting on the green grass, sunshine on our wings. That was when you ripped me away from her. I woke up in a cage among thousands. You came with a tube in my throat, fed me again and again until my fat liver burst. In your plate, on your toast, I was pate for your palate. You scooped me into your mouth and swallowed mercilessly. You stuck your tongue out for the last bit bit of me, tipped the waiter, and that was the end of me. My feathers will never feel the wind. My beak will never taste her honey. I became a cruel pleasure for you. Wow, thanks so much for sharing that, Max. I think you just made me a vegetarian. (laughs) (laughs) I've heard most people say that. (laughs) Yeah, yeah. Well, it's probably a good thing. The more vegetarians, the better, that's for sure. Um, Yeah, thanks so much for sharing that. Yeah, when I I read about how they make pet, and, you know, it was so cruel, and, you know, I I wrote this poem, like, maybe two years ago. Yeah, well, I had no idea. Um, but I've never had pate, or maybe I had once, but but it's not something I eat regularly. That's for sure. And uh, I will definitely it, yeah, never yeah. eat again. <laughs> I had it when I was in France. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Well, thanks for sharing that, Lakshmi. I appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. Um. Let's see. Let's call up Cameron Gray. Trying to find Cameron's poem. Um, there it is. Hey, Cameron, how are you doing tonight? Good. How are you? I'm great. Um, so, oh, and you gave me an attachment. Thanks so much. So, this you have a, a poem about snails. Yeah, I got a thing for snails. <laughs> awesome. Well, um, go ahead whenever you're ready. We'll try to get sort of a lightning round I, kind of vibe. All right. Go gotcha. ahead. called Snail Trails. When the birds get too peckish and the mice scuttle by, I simply slip into my shell. When the moon crawls from slumber and the sun has its nap, I will push my eyes to the sky. When the rock grows too heavy or my lung folds in two, I will know what it means to die. Oh, thanks so much for that. It was Snail, Snail Trails by Cameron Gray. I wish we had snails where we are, but we don't. Um, where, where are you calling from? I can't remember. Kentucky. Kentucky. So you probably got a lot of snails in Kentucky? 
Oh, so many of them. You pick up a rock, they're everywhere. Really? Yeah, we just have no water here, which of course is the problem. But um, oh yeah. yeah, I've never been to California, but yeah. yeah. Well, it hasn't rained. It literally hasn't rained since uh, May, I think, which is the problem. Actually, I don't even think it's rained. I think it snowed the last time there was any precipitation, wow. which is like April or insane. early May. Yeah. Anyway, so that's different. a weird place to live. <laughs> but, hmm. Um, we'll anyway, be thanks. safe with the fires. <laughs> yeah, yeah, we will. Thanks so much, Cameron. Good talking All to right, you. All right, have a good night. Bye. Okay, yeah, let's try to do it like a lightning round really quick. I won't. We won't do much chatter, and we'll just get through these poems. Let's see. Um, Dan Knox. Let's call up Dan. I forgot to put Lakshmi on the caller ID. I got to do that too. Um, but I'll find Dan Knox's poem while we wait. Here we go. Hey, Dan, are you ready to share your poem? I am. Awesome. And that it's adaptable. Um, is there anything yes. you want to say about it before we start? Uh, I've written uh, a few poems for Olympic Peninsula animal, animal sh- and uh, before COVID, hmm. I wrote quite a few. And they would post them on the uh, cat or dog's kennel. Oh, really? Oh, that's a cool idea. Yeah, yeah it is. Really nice. Yeah, we, our dog is a shelter dog, which is really nice to. It's just it's so great to. He's just such a great dog. It's amazing that we got to got to get him. Yeah, they're wonderful. Yeah, they appreciate us. Yeah, they definitely <laughs> do. Uh, so it's adaptable. Go ahead whenever you're ready. Adaptable. How can you help but notice blonde fur with rusty ear tips? My dreamy brown eyes, wet nose, muscles all bring size. I'm a large. Male, mixed hound, weigh around 70 pounds. I will cuddle you on a crisp northwest day. Calm your blood pressure as we walk the gray away. I will let you know when strangers come around. Stay near my home. Protect my ground. Be close to you if you want. Obey your commands. Shake your hand, be respectful of your demands. If we're lucky, I'll be yours and loyal too for a lifetime. I'm the dog for you. Oh, thanks so much for sharing that. That was Adoption by Dan Knox. And that could be written about our dog, Henry. Thanks so much, Dan. Uh huh. Bye bye. Bye. Okay, um, let's go to Kathy Gibbons. Find Kathy's poem. I know I saw it on here somewhere. I thought I did. There it is. Hey, Kathy, how are you doing tonight? Hi, Tim. I'm doing very well. Thank you very much. So what did you write about? What animal? Well, um, I wrote about a dog, and um, we, we're, we've been warning four of our pets, elderly pets we lost over the period of two years. Oh, I'm sorry to hear that. And, but we feel like we're ready to adopt a new rescue baby. And we happened to meet a, um, a young pit bull girl um, on the day that Ruth Bader Ginsburg died. And so um, she she's being fostered by some of her friends. Mm-hmm. And each of them, all four of them in the family, have a different name for her. So, But I wanted to call her Baby Ruth. So. Oh, that's wonderful. I love she's that. She's coming to spend the night soon. Oh, well, that's cool. <laughs> yeah. Well, go ahead and read it whenever you're ready. It's an American okay. sentence. Yes, it's called Baby Ruth, the Dixie Gypsy, pleads her case, an American sentence. I pray that you all choose me to stay with you tonight and every night. Oh, that's wonderful. Thanks so much, Kathy, for sharing that. Thanks, Tim. Good night. Bye-bye. Okay, let's see. Um, Next we will do Richard Westheimer. And we have uh, 16 minutes. I think we can get to everybody who's, who wants to share a poem. Um, so we're calling up Richard. Hey, Tim. Hey, Richard. How are you doing tonight? Good. I'll make it a lightning round. I'll just read the poem. Okay, go ahead. I, Coyote. Go ahead whenever you're ready. I, Coyote. I'd near given up on these humans. They keep their toddlers too close for me to snatch. The man carries bear spray when he runs in the woods, and the woman is friends with a guy who has a night scope on his AR. That man thinks it's sport to take shots at my pack mates and is taken down more than one. But then the woman 
brought home two kittens, and kittens grow up to be cats. I love cats. These people don't know that I dined on their last two. The old gray was easy prey. The brown mouse are put fight, but in the end, I prevailed. These folks are more careless with their critters than their kids. The woman, hears our howls, thinks magic. But what she should be thinking is madness. She read too many stories to her kids about my ancestors. And yes, they had special powers, could walk on their hind legs and trick men into walking naked into the night. The man sees my scat in the fields and along the trails. He knows I can't help myself. He knows I'll shit where I want and take what I can get. He knows I have more in common with his kind, not. Oh, great poem. I, Coyote. And yeah, it's another animal we have a lot of around here. Thanks for sharing and reading that, Richard. Uh, you're welcome. This is sort of a mix between your poem and Megan's yeah. in some respect. Yeah, it kind of is. You're right. Yeah. Yeah. Have a good one. Okay. See ya. Okay. Um, let me see. I wonder. People are coming out a little quiet tonight. Let me see if um, I can adjust the speakers all the way up. Hmm. Okay. Well, I guess that's not it. Um, okay. Let's see. Who do we have next? Um, we still have a bunch of people. Let's do, um, let's do Joy Stahl. So the phone's ringing. I don't think you can hear it. Hello. Hey, Joy. How are you doing tonight? All right. Good to meet you. There yeah. we go. Um, so, so what poem, or what did you write about this week? Well, I wrote from the perspective of my cat, Andromeda, and this is my third attempt. So. <laughs> okay, great. Well, it's ready um, whenever you are, so go ahead. All right. I vibrate when my human fastens on my coat because it means outside. Outside. I chase hoppers and flyers, chew the stuff that grows, and hiss at the bow wows. Awesome. Andromeda. Um, what kind of cat is, is she? Uh, she's half Siamese and half alley cat. Very cool. Well, thanks so much for sharing that, uh, Joy. All right. Thank you. Good night. Okay. Um... Let's go to Gail Hemmen. Hemmen. And um, I'll find Gail's poem as we're waiting. There it is. Evening. Hey, Gail. How are you doing tonight? Oh, I'm doing pretty well. Thanks. How are you, Tim? I'm good. Um, so you have two cats, Sun, Shadow, Sun. Um, is there anything you want to say about it before you read? Um, thank you. I'll keep it real brief. I'm so glad we're on the topic tonight. Uh, this is for a, a woman who ran a cat shelter I used to be part of. So thank you guys for sharing your, your animal-related poems tonight. May we all share joy in this. Yeah, for sure. For sure. Go ahead. Okay, cool. Do we have it on a on screen, Tim, or should I grab my notebook? Real oh, quick? yeah, you got to grab your notebook. You're not going to be able to see it. Okay. Uh, cause... I'm going to move my... <laughs> okay. <laughs> no problem. Um. Um, okay. Yeah, yeah, no problem, no problem. Um, maybe we could have actually had you just read it off of YouTube or whatever you were watching, because it is up now for everybody else. If, but um, but the problem with um, YouTube is that it, it messes up with the bandwidth of your call too, if you have it running or whatever. So here we go. I know okay, running. okay, go ahead. <laughs> okay, um, two cats, sun shadow, sun for Joe McGugan of Feline Friends in Olympia. 
A pair is two cats roaming the yard. One says to the other, it isn't hard. You've not been outside. I've been here before. Just put one paw and another out the door. And soon you'll be in a different land. And meowing, I start to understand. I'm meowing as I start to understand that when we leave a home and go outdoors, whiskers now are measure and tails are oar. As we follow the cat who's been there before, as we explore, find grass on our paws once we know our angle to the sun and way to the door, finally cre finding, creating a pathway to more. Light casts shadows now to show what the sun is for. Each morning, it's now I quickly run to the door. Excellent. So, yeah, thanks so much for sharing that. That was Two Cats, Sun, Shadow, Sun. Thanks so much for sharing that. Thank you, Tim. Yeah, good night. Okay, let's, um, I want to make sure. I think we might have one more person. We have Brent. Um, okay, I think we're good. Let's just, I think Brent's the last caller. So let's do, oh, wait, no, there's an eight. Let's do eight four. Oh no, that's Lakshmi. Sorry, just ignore me. Uh, let's call up Brent. Um, and I'll find Brent's poem. Hey, Brent, how you doing? Uh, just great. How are you? Oh, I, I know how you are. You <laughs> yeah. 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 Well, <laughs> I don't know. I mean, I, Except, checking the camera yeah, was getting, a relief. So I feel, I feel better now than I did when I did, hadn't checked. <laughs> um, yeah. Well, I'm, 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 I'm sure we're all really, really glad that you're still doing it and really glad that you can and hope yeah. that everything works out. Yeah. Well, if we have to evacuate to my, um, my, uh, mother-in-law's house we i don't think we'll be able to do it next week but hopefully we won't have to um yeah so i'm trying to find your poem brent and i you say you have one about a sea otter but i didn't get the attachment yeah. actually if um, you attached it oh you know what huh. i forgot that's all right why don't you just read I it, to it. Why, why don't you just read it okay yeah go ahead we'll just watch right. you read it okay, okay here go we ahead <clears throat> um it's called sea otter Excuse me while I recline in these rolling azure waters. I love to lie in a lovely supine manner and watch the weather. I might fish out my favorite rock from its warm pocket just to play. Other times, I'll use it to crack open a clam, pounding away until its hard little house yields. Relax, friend. If the current begins to lure you toward the deep green sea. I'll hold your hand. Like my children years ago, you'll learn to resist the song of the old waves wild with longing. Excellent. Well, thanks so much, Brent Stuffer. What was that called again? Uh, just the otter. The otter. Awesome. Thanks so much for sharing That's that. That's it. Yeah. yeah. Awesome. Yeah. Thanks, Tim. Yeah, my pleasure. Talk to you later. Next time I'll send the poem. <laughs> yeah, that that yeah. would be a little helpful. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. All right. Thanks. Okay. Um, we actually have one more. Um, we don't usually do this, but Ali Mason did it. I don't want to set a precedent, but he um sent a recording of his call and he sent his poem. So um, let's just do it. So I'll put his poem on screen. This is Al Ali Mason after the attack. It's pretty short. We have time for it, so let's just do it. Uh, after the attack. And hopefully you can hear it. Let me make sure I have all the settings right before I hit play. Um, here we go. After the attack. Hey, Tim. Hey, everybody. Um, my name's Ollie. I, I live in Amsterdam in Europe, so it's a bit of a dodgy time for me uh, um, uh, this time. So I can't be there live, unfortunately, but I'll watch, watch in the morning. Um, and I, I wrote this poem... Uh, well, I've been working on it for a while, um, but I thought it was too serendipitous that I finished it and then this pro prompt came up. So I thought I would submit it for you guys to read. Um, uh, and the only thing you need to know about it is that a drum line is a method of catching sharks. Um, I didn't know uh, that. And, and the rest is pretty self-evident. But here's the, here's the poem. It's called After the Attack. After the Attack. The bloodied stump has long been compressed, and the rubbery-fleshed men have come and gone, 
A one-armed person has been sat on the beach for a couple of days until the end, until neck deep in sand. They were shouting at the waves, how could you? That was the hand my mother gave me. I can't write to her now. How could you? I heard and wondered if I had been a good shark. If it mattered that the bite I took was to taste before deciding to eat. I thought your surfboard was a dolphin is what I would say back if the hook from the drum line wasn't barbed into my throat. Instead, I wish for the quick boat of death. Maybe the armless will wrong-hand a poem forgiving me, asking if we could swim together, teach me shark how I can see in the dark. I feel the wristwatch inside me tick now and smell the hollow bones in sunken ships waiting to rise. That was a great poem, uh, After the Attack by Ali Mason. Thanks so much for doing that, Ali. And that worked really well, actually. So maybe I won't make it official and like list it the guidelines, but if you want to send an audio file like that and a poem, it worked fine. So we can do that from now on for anybody who's um, you know on the other side of the world and has trouble catching us live at this time. Um, it's fun to do people live, and the only problem with the pre-recorded is that I um, you know, it's hard to set up. I have I, it takes a lot of time to set up stuff ahead of time. But if everything is right there and it works fine by email, go ahead and do it, and um, we'll we'll try that more. Uh, there's no problem with that. Thanks so much for sharing that. Again, that was Oliver Mason with uh, After the Attack, and that is it for the show. I want to make sure I didn't miss anybody on the call list, but I, I believe we got everybody. Awesome, we did. Perfect. Okay, so next week's guest is going to be... Oh, let me tell you the prompt again first, just so you don't forget. Uh, Next week's prompt for the open mic is going to be... Hope is a vacant curse. Using Taylor's uh, metaphor advice there. Hope is a vacant curse is next week's prompt. And next week's guest is going to be uh, Kathleen McClung. And her new book, of course, uh, the chapbook winner, one of the three winners of this year's Rattle Chapbook Prize, A Juror Must Fold In On Herself. Um, everybody who's a subscriber already has read this book and um, is probably really looking forward to talking to Kathleen. I know I am. I didn't know her before we published this book of hers. Um, but it's a wonderful book of uh, formal poetry about a uh, sequestered juror and all the things that go on, um, which is a, just a fascinating topic. I, I know about everybody else, but I love jury duty. Um, and, and maybe I'm just fortunate that I can get to do it because I have a kind of flexible job like that. But um, it's a wonderful thing to do, and um, she captured it really, really well in this book, A Juror Must Fold In On Herself. That's Kathleen McClung, Rattlecast number 60, next Tuesday, September 29th, 9 p.m. Eastern Time, as long as we are still here. Let me look over at the... So this is the um, the fire again. Still not over that ridge. As long as it doesn't come around that mountain, we are good to go. Um, and I will see you then with Kathleen McClung, Rattlecast number 60, Tuesday, September 29th. Thanks so much for joining me. Hope you have a great night, and I will talk to you soon. Good night.